That's the door. We've already swapped on our new load valve and we need to make sure that doesn't leak. And we'll do that while we're testing this Cherry 346 XP. Most people say this is an absolute legend of a 50cc saw. So today we're talking dynos and we're going to fix the one big issue that we have with our system. So we finally did it. We finally got around to replacing this one old leaky load valve. And I'll go show you a closer look at our dyno setup and then we'll come back and talk about all of the other dyno options that we have. Bunch of saws to get to. And here we have it. And she's in her working clothes, it's a dirty girl. We've got about 5,000 pulls or so on it. I think there's almost that many actually recorded. We've already swapped on our new load valve and we need to make sure that doesn't leak. And we'll do that while we're testing this Cherry 346 XP. Most people say this is an absolute legend of a 50cc saw. This is a 42 millimeter OE edition. So we'll see what kind of power that puts out and see how our new valve feels. But I just wanted to go over some of the stuff on our dyno here. If you look, the dyno base, it's this nice thick steel plate here. I want to say it's about 5 eighths of an inch. And it's all rubber mounted with sway bar bushings. We got four mounts, so it's actually a little bit isolated from the cart itself. Now this cart started out as a hydraulic pipe bender. And I, my grand plan was to mount a pump, use the tank and everything else. Because, well, our dyno runs on water pressure. So I thought I could have a tank, put the pump here, have a whole self-contained unit, make this portable but I never ended up bothering with it. But the garden hose effect works just fine for what we're doing. So this is our current setup now. And once we get back to the bench, I'll show you where it all started. But this is our torque arm. This is the S-beam load. This S-beam load cell is rated for way more torque than what we're gonna put out. This is a 150 pound unit. And that's why this torque arm is as short as I can get it. That way we use more range on the load cell. Same thing. Load cell, it's got rubber isolation dampers in it. This bracket here is to hold the hoses straight out parallel to the axis. That way they're not pulling on the dyno one way or another. Cause if you have these hoses over, it'll put an extra load on the arm and it'll throw off our power number. Our RPM pickup, we just have a magnet, JB welded into a pocket. Right here, it's kind of hard to see, but every time that passes, it sends an inductive, sends a signal to our data acquisition that it's spinning. So this is where we get our RPM from, three quarter inch keyed shaft. I made these bearing blocks and towers to set everything up. Over here, this is a 6K product, used to be Dansco. This is a 3 8 by 14 sprocket. And it's just keyed, keyed and split locked onto the shaft. And that doesn't move. Let's go. This our bar setup has two pivot points. One here, one down here. That way we can raise or lower the bar. This bar started out as a home light unit. It's a little bit loose on our gauge here. Solid nose 63. So I split it down the middle, took the widest part of the bar that matches our sprocket size good. and. Welded it back together. We put a small steel tail profile with a large steel slot. That way we can utilize it for all sorts of different mounts. And if you notice the pad that the saw is sitting on, we try our best to keep rubbing surfaces off of your nice clean saws. But we got t-shirt material, cardboard, a rubber pad and a steel pad. And then underneath we actually have some jam nuts and a threaded rod so we can adjust the height of this table to fit every different saw and or pipe configuration. This is our actual data acquisition. This is the data logger. This is our load cell monitor. This takes the signal from the load cell, takes it over to our data acquisition. And this is where all the brain work's done. This does all of our equations. And that fan that you hear running is the weather station. So right now it's picking up temperature, humidity, pressure, 
everything in the weather that affects our power reading, it's monitoring in real time. I'll show you on the laptop how quick that is. But this is also all rubber mounted to keep all the vibrations away. So this is our main screen right here. This is our baseline runs for the G366 when it came in. And you'll notice this test time down here, that's super important, 9.98 .9 seconds. I try my best to keep them right at 10 seconds. If I can hit 10 second run after run after run, all the effects are the same and they repeat super close. So as long as I'm within a half a second or one second, either way of our 10 second mark, all these runs repeat super, super close. We well, can see we had 5.09 horse at 10,000 and 3.06 foot pounds at 8,000. Over here on this side is our corrected torque, corrected horsepower, all the way through our RPM range. We do a sweeping scale, max RPM all the way down to 5,000 that way. And this displays our power at every, what is it? Every 250 RPM, this displays our power. These test conditions, we can, we can adjust them. We could make a match every saw, but I don't mess with this side. This is our correction factor. And it corrects to 29.92 barometric pressure on a 68 degree day. That is what, that's the standard correction for all of our runs. Now if we go up here, this is how we start our dyno run. This is the screen that pops up. Since our engine's not running and we're not making any torque, no engine RPM, no dyno spinning, no torque reading. The board temp is right at 58 degrees. That's inside that data box. The current barometric pressure, 28.8. Current humidity, you can see right about 39%. That's the current correction factor. Now this is constantly adjusting up or down to go back to our standard baseline that you've seen on the other screen. Same with the dry density altitude. So this is the way it's set up. I don't bother changing it every time. The only thing we change is our gear ratio. If we have a saw come in that only has a six tooth, we adjust that way the RPM pickup reads the same. Or if we have a saw that comes in with an eight tooth, we can adjust the gear ratio. That way the engine RPM matches the dyno RPM. So these are all the basic overviews. Lots of different reports, lots of different graphs we can go into. I'll show you a sneak peek of some of these graphs. Looky there. There's one of our results for a different test in an upcoming video. But we could put up to six lines on here, change all the different colors. Those familiar with the channel know what these graphs look like. And all right, so here's our dyno cart. You can kind of see bits and pieces of this of our videos. But we got our tack, tuning screwdriver, ear protection, and then all the other flavors of tuning screwdrivers. And we also have a 404 setup in case we get into the big saws with big old saws with a spur only that only have a 404. We can throw that on and we can run the old school saws that only have the 404 set up. This drawer, we've got our spare dyno chains. I said these are just a cutterless chain. 74 drivers, works awesome on our setup. And after a while, the chains get wore out, they get real hitchy, they don't spin, they don't roll very nice. So we keep a few extra chains on stock. Spark checker, another tack. Miscellaneous dyno sheets. We got a lot of those around here. And this one, that's the holy grail if you're looking for two-stroke information. We've got all sorts of two-stroke books, old ones, new ones, SAE documents, exhaust. Like I said, you can never have too much information. Then down there, that's our calibration weight. That's the weight that we block up the torque arm and we just do a weight hang and make sure that it matches our load cell. We'll do that every now and then, especially if we run into a gremlin that, hey, this power reading's way off, spiking all over the place. So we keep our, we keep our calibration weight right there handy. 
and like I said, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as we have our measurements right, and we're hanging the same weight off the same arm, and it gives us the same reading, we know our calibration's in spec. But so far, over the last couple years, this has been super solid, and I am curious, I want to see exactly how many pulls we've done. So, so you can see right here, 4,651 tests in here. Now that's not even counting the year that I had this on the old setup, and that's not counting all the missed runs that we forgot to push the button on. But we got, we got 4,600 tests on all sorts of different saws, so we can check stock, modified, everything, any run on anything. That's the nice thing about going all out with your dyno system, is you have the information right here at your fingertips. All right, so that's my current setup. And in this pile of parts here is where we all started. I have a whole complete spare setup just for situations like this. This leaky valve, had I not had extra parts and this repair didn't work, I would have been up a creek on dyno and all of your customer saws. So we got our spare setup, which is the same as what my original was. This is a land and sea cart setup. They call this their seven inch absorber and it's rated for 17,000 RPM. This is the factory torque arm and on their setup, they have a strain gauge. That strain gauge actually measures how much this aluminum is compressing and stretching. And that calculated into their software tells you how much torque is being applied to this arm. Well, that works out for a little bit. Didn't work out super awesome for me because I broke my factory arm. So I bought the $550 replacement and that lasted all of like three weeks. Now, that was partially my fault but it took forever to get the arm and everything out. And what had happened is my, my system had slipped the key. So this was wobbling around a little bit excessively and that was what damaged the torque arm. But I didn't want to be going through those torque arms like candy. Since we're talking dynos, I figured we could go over a couple of the questions people ask all the time. How to do a dyno, what kind of dyno, where, why, how, who, how much. So we'll touch base on all those subjects. We got here a flywheel flywheel and this would be for your inertia type setup now on your inertia setups it's about as simple as you can get you have a flywheel of known mass known diameter you put it on a shaft and you hook your engine to the shaft and all you need for a flywheel is you need something to measure time and something to measure rpm and since you already know how much it weighs what size it is you could calculate how much time it takes to get to a certain RPM. Needs to be sized to the type of power that you're doing. So when I was looking at these, I was like, well, I wanna do the little saws all the way up to the big saws and some of the race saws. Well, some race saws, big 120, 130, 140 cc saws, probably putting out in the neighborhood a 30, 35 horse, maybe even more. And Wanted to go all the way down to the little 25 cc's. Those are only a horse and a half, two horse. That's a pretty big range for an inertia dyno. And the problem with a range like that is you can only spin your flywheel so fast. If you spin this too fast, it can actually explode. The centrifugal force will actually rip this material right apart. And this one is mighty thin. This is only, now this one is pretty thin. It's only three eighths of an inch. And this one, it's almost not stiff enough to not wobble as it's rotating. Now, there's a company, Hewitt Inertia Dinos. You can look them up. They're really good. They have a really nice setup. I looked awful hard into it. Most of their flywheels are one inch thick minimum, ground, precision ground on each side, and mounted and balanced on a shaft. But most of those are rated for 20, 30 horse and you have to adjust your gear ratio to make sure you don't have this 24, 30 inch flywheel over speeding. The thing that kind of steered me away from the inertia was I wanted to do a wide range of low power. And I wasn't super comfy having a 200 pound flywheel spinning at two, three, four thousand 4,000 RPM. But you can use a small flywheel, smaller flywheel, you can spin faster but you also don't have as large of a moment of inertia. So if your run is too short, you don't have good data. And if your run's too long, that's heating up the clutch, might not be repeatable. 
So those are just some of the things with the inertia dyno, why I didn't go with them. A hydraulic dyno, just a hydraulic motor. You need your tank, you need a hydraulic motor and or hydraulic pump, a valve, and a way to mount the sprocket to your pump. Now with the hydraulic setup, just like with the inertia, you need to gear it down. Most hydraulic motors won't do the 10 to 14,000 that the saws will spin. So you need a big sprocket on the motor and a small sprocket on the saw to get the RPM manageable. So you can do a simple setup. Just have a hydraulic pump if you think of like a log splitter setup. Tank, hoses, pump, and a valve. Well, the valve open, the pump can free spin, there's no pressure made. So on a simple hydraulic setup, just have your gauge, PSI. As your saw is spinning, you close that valve and see where the PSI stops when that saw stops. Notifications, do the same test again and see if you gain 20, 30, 40 PSI. Or you can go all out and you can add a load cell into the mix, mount your torque arm to your motor, and as you're applying the load, that torque arm will get the measurement and you end up with a system just like mine. Your hydraulic pump or motor turns into a brake at that point. When you mount your torque arm and load cell, you just do the equation. The distance from your shaft to the end of your torque arm is your torque. You know, one foot and one pound would be one foot pound of torque. So if you're doing that, you need to measure RPM still, load still, and time. There's another setup where you can use an alternator or a type of electric motor. Now there are a couple people on YouTube already that have used an automotive type alternator to make a saw dyno. Just mount your torque arm on it, load cell, just like any other type of brake dyno. And, you, and they use a Your Dyno setup, that's the brand name, you can look them up, Your Dyno. They use a Yordino controller to control the load applied on that alternator. And that works real nice. That software setup works awesome. You can actually electronically control it and hold it. But you're limited to the amount of power you can hold by how big your alternator is. You have to have a big enough alternator and enough current to break the required horsepower. But there seem to be working real well with the saw type power. And you could also potentially hook up an electric motor or an alternator, spin it, and get the reading out in volts, watts, and convert it that way. But I don't have all the details on actually measuring the output that way. If you guys know, leave a comment, let me know. Let me know how I'm doing with this. But this was all the questions I get all the time. Well, what kind of dyno should I do? Why did you pick yours? Well, I'll go into, so I'll go into why I got my dyno. I just love these engines and I stopped cutting wood because I didn't need, didn't have a boiler for my house. So I wanted to build the saws, didn't really have a ton of wood to cut and didn't want to have to take every saw out to the wood pile and then figure out what chain, what the wood variables and what the chain variables were. Every other type of motorsports has dynos. We got the bikes, the cars, the trucks, everything else. They all dyno their engines, get their power output. So that's what I wanted for these saws that I enjoy playing with. So that led to getting the cart set up. And then we have a pretty well equipped machine shop. I found this land and sea set up that was all ready to go. All I had to do was hook a garden hose up and it worked. And it did for a little while. But with my water break set up, it just discharges the water out. So it just, you hook your garden hose up and the water goes through one time and goes out to the drain. Now we're not talking a whole lot of water. I can do a bunch of pulls on five gallons of water and it never seems to heat up because we're not pushing the limits. With the proper water pressure and a proper supply, this little break here will actually support up to a hundred horse, which we're nowhere near that. The torque arm was nowhere near rated for that. But our current setup, we can probably push that 50 horse pretty safely. So at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters with what kind of dyno setup is the accuracy. And I say accuracy, and I mean repeatability. The number that it puts out really doesn't matter. Because you test it before, you get a number. You test after modifications, you get a number. Same setup, same everything, before and after. 
that change, that difference between the before number and the after number is all that really matters. That's what I mean when I say accuracy of a dyno. You could do 10 pulls in a row and they repeat pull after pull after pull after pull. You know you have a sweet setup. If you can come back a week later, do a pull with the same exact saw, and you're pretty much the same exact number that you had last time, you know you're doing something right. So that repeatability is what you're looking for in any kind of dyno. And that's where I went all out with mine. It costs a lot of money to do that. There's companies out there. You can check with performance trends and see exactly what my software hardware setup costs. Your dyno is another good option. Sport devices is another option. And that is where you would find all your data acquisition software. You can go as cheap as you want. That just does time, speed, torque. But you still need all the hardware. You still need to make the bench. You still need everything else to get it all hooked up. The main reason I decided to spend the money was for the tech support. If I had an issue, I didn't want to be all alone up a creek, kind of like I was with the original system. That tech support at that time... They just said, oh yeah, it's old, buy the new stuff. No, that wasn't what I was looking for. They said, I can fumble my way through a lot of this tech stuff, but building a whole system from scratch, like people have done, definitely wasn't for me. I, went, I pushed that easy button and I bought the setup. This is the load cell I need. This is what I need to make it work. Hook it to your computer, input this program, and hey, look, you'll have a functioning dyno. You push two buttons, you get a graph. Your budget and your goals are really the only determining factors. How much of this stuff you could do yourself, how much you have to outsource. So I really hope that this answers some questions about dynos, where to get information. And you really do have to do the legwork yourself, figure out what kind of engine you want to test, what kind of outputs you want to see. Only dictated by your imagination on how you want to do it, what you want to see, and how much you want to spend. <laughs>